Okay, Morgan, are you ready to roll? Let's kick it off. <laughs> awesome, terrific. Well, welcome everybody and thank you for attending the latest in our interactive dialogue series. As those of you who have joined us before know, this is intended as uh, a process where instead of taking you know 75 slides and screaming at the internet uh, for an hour about them, we take a topic and try to explore it in a little bit more depth and also in a little bit more interactive format than is often typical for CLE presentations. So delighted to have you here today for this iteration of the interactive dialogue. This year in 2021, uh, the food and beverage industry has really been experiencing a, a tremendous growth in agricultural and processor and other mergers and acquisitions. That's something we've been seeing. We'll be talking about that a bit today. But as a result of that, we decided to take that process of merger and acquisition and to do a bit more extended view of it. So today's program is the second in a three-part series. The first part was analyzing the pre-sale process and identifying best practices in which the uh, folks that might either be considering a merger or acquisition, either side, uh, especially on the sell side, the things that one could do to really help accelerate uh, the, the uh, process and also, frankly, increase the price. Uh, and so in any event, if you have not participated, if you didn't have a chance to watch that program, please do so. It's on Dorsey.com. Today's presentation, as we'll be talking about in a moment, is the deal timeline and the process. And then the final presentation, which will be in about six weeks or so, will be on the important aspects of integration. So a couple of things as we uh, kick off. Uh, we do, of course, have uh, program uh, materials. But if you have specific questions, then I highly encourage you to ask us in the chat pain. Uh, you'll see that at the bottom of your screen and just send a chat. That'll go to all the participants. I'll be monitoring that and we'll either ask the question directly or we'll uh, let you know that it's coming up in a slide or two and make sure that we get to all of your questions uh, through the chat pane. So please ask them there. If you'd like to keep it anonymous, please let me know. Uh, otherwise, I might say, you know, this uh, question comes in from Bob. And uh, Bob, by the way, uh, and Van, I think, are the two people who've attended every single presentation. So thank you for that of, of interactive dialogue. Not just this one, but all of them uh, from the beginning. Uh, and so in any event, I might say, you know, first name or the like, but uh, I'll try and keep it anonymous. And I'll definitely keep it anonymous if you tell me to in the chat pane. So with that, uh, we, uh, a couple of things just as we, as we uh, launch in, uh, you'll have received a reminder yesterday that has both the entire presentation materials in it and also information about a CLE credit and the sign-in sheet, which was attended on the uh, reminder. So just uh, fill that information out for your CLE credit. So anyway, my name is Mike Droke, and I'm a partner in the Food, Beverages, and Agribusiness Group. I'm based out of the Seattle office, and I work in Seattle and California primarily, although our Food, Beverages, and Agribusiness Industry Group is uh, large, and we regularly work with clients from all across the U.S. Just in the last six months, I've worked on issues as far away as Florida, uh, North Carolina, uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and, and the like, uh, and obviously in, in the Western states, which is where I regularly work. And in that context, uh, working with the 200-member uh, group of the Food, Beverages, and Agribusiness Industry Group, uh, which comprises lawyers from all different practice areas, from patents uh, to corporate and the like, I've had the unique privilege of working with Morgan Helm, who is uh, vice chair of that group uh, as a senior associate in the Minneapolis office and just a, a tremendous colleague and friend. Uh, and I think, Morgan, you and I had the privilege of, of doing your first presentation together. Is that right? Am I remembering we that correctly? did correct? indeed, yes. In, in Spokane, Washington. And when you told me that uh, at the beginning, uh, or after we were done with the presentation, you said, Mike, you know, that was my first big presentation in front of a group of 300 CEOs of food and agribusiness companies. I was you thought that was crazy. You did such an amazing job. So it's such a privilege to work with you. Uh, and uh, so can you give the group a little bit of a background uh, on yourself? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, I'm an attorney based out of our Minneapolis office. My practice focuses largely on mergers and acquisitions, um, a substantial percentage of which are in the food and ag space. Uh, you know, I, I, I do deals across the nation, some international deals as well. 
Um, over the years, I've worked with buyers and sellers of agricultural software, uh, grocery stores, manufacturing facilities, um, some cooperative consolidations, uh, just to name a few. And what sparked your interest in that industry? You know, my grandpa was an apple farmer and a packing plant manager, so I don't think he ever really thought that's how his legacy would, would continue, but here we are today. Um, but beyond that connection, I, I really enjoy working with people who are passionate about their business, and I think food and ag people are, are super passionate about what they do and about finding new ways to feed the world. Fantastic. Uh, I'm sure grandpa is proud or would be proud. So uh, the, the, as we're talking about, uh, obviously, we've done some preparation today, but the concepts that we'll be discussing in the, the deal timeline and kind of how the, the deal process works, are those unique to agriculture or they relate really to any business would be considering a, a sale? Yeah, I mean, these are fairly universal. There are some unique factors that come up more often in, in food and agriculture, um, but the general process we're talking about can apply across industries. So we have some uh, examples of deal timelines, and uh, I had just as we as we get to that, I, I, I want to just check a observation that I've been having that in the last six months, it seems like there have been a lot of merger and acquisition inquiries and, and activity interest. Has that been true uh, from your perspective as well? Uh, yeah, absolutely, 100%. I think we had a brief pause at the start of the pandemic as people tried to figure out what was going on. Uh, but from there, deal activity did not skip a beat. Um, you know, I think we're seeing companies being acquired or going up for sale on both ends of the spectrum. We're looking at companies that really struggled to get through the pandemic and are looking for an exit and those that did just gangbusters business and are looking to capitalize on it at their peak. So starting with the um, first group, uh, as we think about things like deal timeline examples, the first group meaning those that really struggled in the beginning of the pandemic or maybe throughout the entirety of the pandemic, um, how does that affect uh, the deal timeline for them? You know, that's an interesting question. I think um, it can go either way. If you think you're going to improve over the next couple of months, you might pause a little. You might be trying to get out before the next tough uh, life cycle of your business, but you might not be trying to do it right away. And then how about uh, for those that went gangbusters? Uh, yeah, again, I mean, you, you want to strike while the fire is hot. And if your financials from 2020 were just incredible, you want to get those in front of buyers now. If, if you want to sell, which may, Correct, it may be yeah. that you decided not to. Um, no. the, I've heard uh, talk about fear of capital gains tax. Uh, and I, I, I'm struck by, it, first, first question is, does that drive at all the interest in activity, in merger and acquisition activity? Yeah, I think that's the case. We heard it a ton at the end of 2020, just people, particularly people who uh, exiting their business was their retirement plan um, and wanting to get out before anything changed. I haven't been hearing that mentioned a lot lately, but I think as the new administration moves their tax plans forward, uh, it's going to be coming up again. And it, it does implicate the timeline. And, and for um, that, you know, one of the elements that I've found in, in, in just as a general business proposition, perhaps, is that sometimes it's the fear of it as much as the reality uh, that really drives behaviors. What do you think of that? Yeah, it's definitely a fear thing. I mean, uh, when we were talking to our tax team, they're like, there's never been a tax increase that's been retroactive. It doesn't mean that that's not going to happen, but it's pretty unlikely. So you're probably safe until something's actually passed. Uh, but but when you're talking about the sale of your business that you've built up from scratch and and this is your future and your kids' future, um, that fear can drive a lot. So, can you um, kind of walk uh, through the the deal timelines? Obviously, you've um, color coded certain things, and 
so you the make it easy to see okay here's a comparison this is not obviously a, a, a true timeline format because if we had that you wouldn't be able to read words like draft and negotiate purchase agreement on the aggressive schedule it'd be in like one point font or something right uh, yeah. compared to the other timeline uh you know uh can can you walk folks through first uh, the aggressive timeline and how that works? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I think I'll, I'll actually do kind of the reverse. Um, no one really wants to do a slow timeline unless they're they're really nervous about risk and wanting to take their time and really think about it. You know, I think if anyone's kicking off a deal, they have, both sides have a lot of reasons to get it done as quickly as possible. Um, so when you're looking at whether or not an aggressive timeline is possible, you're really looking to what the controlling factors are outside of the buyer and seller group that might make that practical or impractical. Got it. You know, I often think that in, in a way it's, it's not, obviously it's a lot more complicated to sell a business than selling a home. But it's similar to that in a way where if you're the seller, uh, you might want to, you know, go into it really prepared. And then there's a process, right? You have an offer that's extended and uh, then they, you know, will come and uh, do an inspection of the house. And then you finalize that, sign the checks transfer and the like and the, and the title transfers. And, and in a certain way, uh, you know, it's, it's similar when you're selling a business. Is that a fair comparison? Yeah, I think so. That's the case. And I think one of the other things when you were looking at these timelines to keep in mind is we're starting here at the point of the letter of intent. So that means we have a buyer and a seller identified. There can be a lot that happens behind the scenes before that point. You could do an auction process um, where you see who is interested in your business. Um, so, so this is just a, a portion of the timeline that goes into it. Fantastic. So starting with that letter of intent, uh, just uh, briefly, uh, I guess, can you can you describe the, the ways that you arrive at that? So before the letter of intent, what happens just before that? Um, yeah, I mean, it depends. Some people get unsolicited offers and it's an offer that they can't refuse. Some people are going out there and specifically marketing their business um, and working with an investment banker to see who's out there who might be interested and at what price point. Um, and so there might be some diligence that happens before, uh, before you get to that letter of intent, high level things that people need to review in order to make an offer um, that tends to be largely financial, sort of a, a blind reading into your top 10 customers um, without names to get a sense of how your business is divided, things like that. Got it. So there'll be, in other words, be a little bit of initial information sharing uh, beforehand, possibly uh, non-disclosure agreements are signed. And then there's a, you know, a review of the most material factors of, of the valuation of the business. Is that, is that right? Absolutely. And you might do some management presentations where, where your corporate team talks about what's unique about your business, what makes it attractive um, to, to really sell the business and put your best foot forward. And by management presentations, do you mean like a, a PowerPoint or do you mean actually a, a presentation with the management team there talking about their business? Uh, it could be both. Sometimes you just distribute a, a sort of PDF packet with a high level and sometimes you, you get in front of people and uh, management talks to them and there's an opportunity to, to answer questions and have a dialogue. So then uh, somebody... Uh, issues a, 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 an offer, right, uh, uh, of some kind or another, and then that that might result in a letter of intent. And briefly, what is that letter of intent? Yeah, I mean, the letter of intent is going to memorialize the key terms of the deal that the parties want to make sure are, are sort of firmed up and finalized before they move forward, before they start sharing basically the crown jewels of the business, all the information that no one outside the business normally sees. Um, so obviously. Price is a big one on that, um, but there might also be other things that you, that you include depending on um, what's unique to your business. And then is that letter of intent something that's binding on everyone or can you walk away if for whatever reason you're not interested ultimately, one side or the other? 
Uh, yeah, they're, they're usually non-binding with a, a few exceptions for key provisions, one of which is an exclusivity provision, um, which is really just, a, we call it a no-shot provision. So the seller can't continue to go around to potential buyers and see if they're interested while they're working with this buyer they've signed the letter of intent with. Got it. And then a uh, final question on that is I noticed that you start off with week one on both is a letter of intent. Uh, how did you, when did you uh, come to that as the kickoff point? Um, that's really the point where um, most people, if they have not engaged outside counsel to negotiate that letter of intent, they'll reach out to their outside counsel to kick things off and that they bring more of their uh, team into the deal. Um, so how long it takes to negotiate a letter of intent can can vary and that can take some time in and of itself but that's the point where um people are are locked in that exclusivity period starts taking and the uh, the deal really gets moving got it and then uh just again level setting some of the terminology here you the next uh segment of time is called due diligence what is due diligence uh, due diligence is really a fact gathering process. Going back to that uh, home buying analogy, that's when you do uh, uh, bring in your inspector and then you get into uh, the bones of the house and see what's there and what's hiding behind the scenes. So from a, a deal perspective, it's reviewing contracts, financials, uh, marketing plans, uh, um, looking at the HR roster, all of that. Got it. And so uh, I was thinking last night about today's presentation. And uh, as my as my children say, I, I started practicing law in a different millennium. Back in that day, we had a, a room where you would put these binders of information. And so we called that the data room. And you'd be able to go physically into the data room. There's usually a big table there. And you pull the binders out, look at the contracts, take notes on this thing called paper. And uh, uh, I, I'm assuming that uh, data rooms aren't quite the same anymore. Is that right? Uh, yes, data rooms are entirely virtual these days. There's a number of different hosting platforms, but it's a website you log into. It's normally organized by uh, different sort of large buckets of folders. So organizational documents, employment, real estate, um, and then the full deal team on the buyer and seller side will have access. Got it. And then does that get segmented between the parties, meaning that, you know, the seller may have more information than they disclose and things like that? Absolutely. I mean, you sometimes do a slow rollout of information when you're on the sell side of, of things that are sensitive that you know they're going to want to see, but you want to sort of hold them back for a little bit. Um, and you'll work with your outside counsel and potentially your investment banker if you're working with one of them to determine. And then in, in addition to due diligence, and you mentioned management presentations, possibly what other, I'm sorry, data room and uh, the management presentation, what other aspects are there to due diligence? Um, you know, sometimes there are things like site visits. Um, a lot of those have been happening virtually right now, but there are very good reasons um, uh, to do a site visit and to really be on the ground and see, particularly if there's real estate involved. Um, if there is real real estate involved, you might do some environmental assessments um, and, and other things like that. Real estate involved meaning owned property rather than leased property? Correct. Got it. And then the other aspect I would say is that often the management team will continue or parts of it will. And so on both sides, they want to know each other. Uh, who, yeah. who will I be reporting to now? And then from the buyer perspective, who will I be supervising and having run this business? Absolutely. Any other parts of the due diligence process? Um, I mean, the other key part of it is that it's an issue spotting process. So it's not just uh, gathering facts, it's figuring out what might be problematic and what you need to address or what might need to be remediated before, uh, before you close. Got it. So the, the next one in yellow is called draft and negotiate the purchase agreement. Can you talk to what that means? Sure. Um, so any deal is going to have a purchase agreement, which memorializes all of the terms of the deal. Um, you'll see that runs a little bit behind due diligence because it's a bit of a back and forth process. Um, the things you discover in due diligence are going to inform what that purchase agreement looks like, uh, what the structure is going to be if you're going to do an asset sale, a stock sale, or a merger. Um, and then as you start negotiating the purchase agreement, some of the things that come out of that are going to feed back and uh, have follow-up questions uh, for due diligence. And so there's a back and forth there. 
you know, I often tell clients that uh, you can have a uh, napkin that says, I, Mike Droke, sell my entire business to Morgan Helm for $1, and we both sign it, and that's a purchase agreement. Or you could have a 200-page document which lays out all kinds of issues that have been disclosed or not, and that's also a purchase agreement. Uh, how, how do you, um, obviously the more involved one is a more careful risk allocation process. Uh, can you talk about how, you, how one decides what type of purchase agreement you would be looking at and how it gets negotiated? Um, you know, that's an interesting question. I mean, it, it is all risk allocation. It is um, how comfortable you are that what you what you've learned in the diligence process is true and correct, how much you want the seller standing behind that. Um, but it's also, if you feel like you haven't solicited all the information you're looking for out of that diligence process, you can get a lot of that via the purchase agreement as well. Um, you know, if you're asking sellers to make a representation regarding all of the IP that they own and list it out, um, if, if they haven't given you a full IP portfolio and due diligence, it might be something you really push for to make sure both sides are totally aware of what's out there. So this is that correlation you're talking about between due diligence and the drafting process. Absolutely, yeah. And, and then I hear a lot about reps and warranties. What are those? Uh, yeah, so reps and warranties are basically statements that the seller is asking uh, to say are true and correct. Um, and then to the extent any of those statements in the purchase agreement are not true and correct, they'll need to disclose those exceptions. Um, and then some of these are just listing exercises. So you'll ask the seller to list out all of their material contracts. Um, and then you know the, the scope of what you're signing on to. Got it. Uh, I know uh, I've worked with uh, various insurance companies like Marsh and the like, and uh, I, I know that we're seeing a lot more rep and warranty insurance. What is that? Yeah, so rep, rep and warranty insurance is, is a new risk allocation. Um, new is not entirely correct, but it's growing and it's becoming uh, more and more prevalent in deals. So essentially, instead of the seller and the shareholders standing behind all of those reps and warranties after closing, uh, the insurer steps in and, and, and does that for them. Got it. And then uh, can you walk through the, the remaining parts, signing uh, interim period and closing? Uh, sure. So uh, this is another, it depends. Sometimes signing and closing happen at the same time. You sign the purchase agreement and you close on the same day. Um, when that doesn't happen, the signing will be the purchase agreement and potentially some other definitive agreements. So you might sign some employment agreements that will be effective at the time of closing but you get them locked in at the time of signing. Um, and then this interim period is where you go out and, and seek sort of third party approvals, uh, uh, do any government filings, anything that needs to happen um, in order to get to closing that will be laid out in the purchase agreement as a closing condition. Um, and then once all of those are satisfied, uh, you will close the deal, which means you hand the keys over. Got it. Now, I know you said that in most cases, people aspire to the aggressive timeline, much like if you've decided you're going to sell your home, you want to get it done. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes it goes longer, etc. And you've listed out some factors here. I, I love the foreshadowing of the first bullet <laughs> size. Uh, it will impact it, but the timing, but maybe not the way you think. So what do you mean by that? Uh, yeah, so I mean, I think it's really easy to think that like a small deal can happen very quickly. There's not as much involved. It's maybe lower risk. Uh, but a lot of the times I see that this has an inverse relationship. Um, when you're looking at a larger deal, you probably have more sophisticated parties who have done this before. Um, they might have a team who was totally dedicated to M&A work. And so they not only know the ropes, but they're also devoted entirely to getting the deal done. Um, whereas with a smaller deal, um, there's sort of that fear of this is the first time I've done this. This is for the first and maybe only time I'll ever do this. Um, some nerves in there. There are smaller teams, so fewer people to respond to requests. Um, and they've got a day job. They have to keep running the business while they're doing the deal. And that can't be understated how that can really slow things down in ways that they don't anticipate at the start. You know, and I would say that 
when you have an owner that's not the person managing day to day, uh, I've found myself a lot of times really emphasizing that point that we just doubled the jobs of certain people. We'll get to those people on the next slide, but definitely has a huge impact. And there's only you end up hitting a bottleneck to some degree, right? Absolutely. Yes. And then uh, you've alluded to this before, but um, the approvals aspect and, uh, you know, the thing that I'd like you to kind of talk about what you mean by that and where those approval requirements generate from. Sure. I mean, there, there's a lot of different potential third parties that you're going to need to get to sign off on this deal. Um, contracts are a big one. A lot of contracts have hidden back there in the boilerplate, the miscellaneous section, um, a notice or consent requirement for an assignment or change of control. Um, and all of those are gonna be people you potentially need to go talk with and get their sign off on the deal. Um, there's also governmental approvals, uh, permits, and if you're doing a, a stock deal or maybe some other um, structures, you might need to get all your shareholders approval um, or if you're co-op members, and that can be a lengthy list. So, so one uh, kind of comment and recommendation, I guess, from my perspective is, that even if you're you're not considering a sale of the business, it's really important to read the boilerplate and look in particular at the transfer, success, succession, uh, any kind of change of control uh, provision. And often there's a paragraph describing what a change of control is. Stop and read it. Make sure you understand the percentages based on your actual business and the like. Because what happens is sometimes that information gets kind of thrown in. And as you said, Morgan, the boilerplate. Uh, and at the time that you're negotiating the contract, it can often be very easy to negotiate around uh, a provision say that says that you can't transfer the content, contract rights except in the context of a sale of the business or substantially all of the business. And the contracting parties at the early stages might say, okay, that looks good. I'm, I'm okay with that as a exception. Uh, on the other hand, if you are trying to negotiate these consents uh, in the process of closing the deal, then that can be very expensive and, and time consuming because they have a lot of leverage at that time. Is that is that a fair characterization? Yeah, it's a fair characterization. I think you need to make sure that the, the folks who are negotiating your contract day to day um, have ha know what your standard positions are and have some frameworks for negotiating these. Um, there might be circumstances where you have no leverage, where the other party to the contract really cares to know who they're doing business with and wants to know if that's changing, um, but it's always worth the conversation. Um, the other thing that I would say is there might be some times that even though your contract doesn't have a notice or consent requirement, your buyer wants you to go talk to those people. You know, if it's the like, top customer that you have that you do 75% of your business with, they probably are going to want them to be on board regardless of what that contract says. You know, it's a really important point, Morgan. Um, and I've seen that play out even in situations where the top say three customers uh, represent 50% of the sales or 45%. So not a majority even, but uh, nonetheless, the buyer wants to know those folks are on board, regardless of your contracts or history with those customers. Absolutely. I mean, even if their termination rate is two years out, that drastically changes the business in a, in a pretty short time window. So the idea here for those that are listening is that the, you, you may have a lease agreement for example, that uh, has a requirement that the landowner agrees to the transfer of the lease. So a purchaser coming in, they buy the quote unquote assets of the business, but if they can't keep it in the facility, then that causes a major problem. Uh, so the landlord has some control over the, the leasing uh, transfer of those agreements. And uh, Morgan, I, I know that there are kind of presumptions of uh, transferability uh, or consent requirements uh, for various kinds of contracts like intellectual property versus general contracts. Can you talk to that? 
Yeah, sure. So if your contract is silent and, and it doesn't touch on change of control or assignment at all, um, the general rule of thumb is that it's freely assignable, um, except for intellectual property licenses and also personal services. So if, if I'm hiring you, Mike Drove, to do something for your expertise, you can't uh, uh, assign it to, to Bob for um, without consent. Got it. And that it's also a matter of state law. So you'll, you'll need to look at uh, the various states that you're operating in, but those general principles are important to know. And then you mentioned, uh, uh, you know, permits, obviously, that's pretty straightforward as to transferability, but something important to, to pay attention to. And then the next one is shareholders and the number of shareholders. So what do you mean by that? Uh, yeah, so I mean, if, if your company is held by five people and uh, the, you, they are involved in the business day to day and you know you're going to be able to walk down to their office and get them to sign an agreement, that might not be a particular barrier. Um, we see this a lot, particularly with co-ops, where you have a, a huge roster of members potentially located around the country. Um, and this is a major transaction that will require member approval either a majority or a super majority approval that you'll need to do an education process and get their approval. Um, and also making sure you have a way to actually contact them because uh, sometimes those member rosters aren't up to date. You mean I can't use DocuSign on my flip phone? <laughs> uh, yes, that's another really important thing is to keep in mind who your shareholder population is. Um, I see this a lot with startup companies that have run for a long time. So you have those initial investors, family and friends, and you get to the sale point and now you're dealing potentially with estates, um, folks who owned their shares jointly and now one has passed. How do you handle that? Um, that can be really complicated. So this is one of those elements that on the sales side, I really recommend that you think about pretty deeply uh, because Morgan, as you're describing, you have two elements, at least from my perspective. Number one is kind of a crossover between the legal minimum requirements in the state of a corporation and also the governance elements because you may have self-imposed a higher uh, either quorum majorities and the like for certain major transactions. So that's kind of number one. And then the second is, okay, how are we gonna to get to that number? How do we get enough people in a room, design a process so that we're going to not only have the appropriate number of shareholders who are involved, but also to really sell them on why this is a good thing for them. And so I, 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 as you've described, Morgan, I've seen this in particular with cooperatives because both factors are complicated. Uh, you know, there are often legal minimums that, uh, or governance document like uh, articles of incorporation or bylaws that uh, sets certain minimums. And then also the sales process requires uh, more deliberation, thought, time, effort, uh, in-person meetings and, and the like. Um, so it can be successful, but it's very important to be factoring that into the timeline, right? Right. And I mean, this isn't something that's entirely in the seller's control. The buyer has a say in this too. Just because you can sell the business with 51% doesn't mean your buyer is necessarily going to be comfortable acquiring it if there are 49% of your shareholders who strongly object to it and didn't want to do it. Just because you can drag them along doesn't mean you necessarily want to. So a good example of that would be an agricultural process or own, you know, run as a co-op where that 49% are also your suppliers. So yep. uh, are you going to have enough supply and, you know, are they going to be able to pull their friends and family against, the, you know, the entity and the like? So good, mm -hmm. very important point. So the, the, the next uh, topic you threw out the three letters we all love, HSR, uh, what does that stand for? Uh, so HSR stands for the Hart Scott Rodino Act. This is an antitrust act that requires uh, parties to report certain transactions uh, to the FTC and the Department of Justice Antitrust Division um, so that they can assess the potential competitive effects of, of the sale. And uh, I know you're not an antitrust lawyer. We have some exceptional people in the firm who handle these. But generally speaking, uh, what's the threshold for when you need to be thinking about an HSR filing? 
Yeah, so there are two components here. The first is the size of the transaction. And there you're looking at if it's a deal between 92 million currently and 368 million, you might need to file. If you're over that 368, you absolutely need to file. Uh, you have no options. Um, after you look at the transaction size, then you have to look at the size of the parties involved, which involves looking at their annual net sales or their total assets um, to, to see if you uh, meet that next test for reportability. So this is one of those elements that you could kind of understand based on the offer price at the LOI stage. Is that fair? Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, it is a more complicated one that you want to spend time on. But if you're borderline, you want to look at it regardless, but it'll be pretty clear if you're way off the mark. It, you know, and, and sometimes these things can really kind of come in in interesting ways. I, I had an uh, example years ago of a client that was selling that was uh, basically in the um, natural uh, kind of vitamins in the, in the light market, and they were being bought by another company that was in the same industry. And so, uh, you know, the regulators became interested in that because uh, they were looking at it from a perspective of only people who are selling just vitamins. And so we ended up going back and reviewing it and explaining that, well, actually, really, it's anywhere you can obtain vitamins. And so you have to include the, you know, Kroger and Safeway and Walmart and, you know, all these other places that you can get this product. And it was very clear that this was not going to have an impact on competition uh, for, for those people who wanted the product, right? So that was the major issue. Uh, but it's important to really be thinking about that somewhat early on. Uh, and, and I would say, particularly in situations where your, the acquisition is between competitors. Is that fair? Yeah, that's a fair assessment. If, if you're dealing with direct competitors, then this is a, a whole different analysis and, and you wanna make sure you're paying attention to it very early on. So the other aspect that's important to know is that when the, the HSR filing happens, there's typically a delay of time, about 30 days. There's a payment that's required, a fee for making the filing, which varies based on the size. And then also the, uh, there can be at times a process to collapse and accelerate uh, the HSR filing process. Uh, however, currently that has been paused. So we're in the, you know, kind of waiting and there's not a way to request accelerated review for simpler transactions. So it just kind of is what it is. And then once the filing happens, then the deal is uh, public at that point. And so uh, you know, being aware of that, that somebody can and people do uh, review those HSR filings. Uh, and so you should be thinking about that on both sides. Yeah, uh, your, your local business reporters are going to be monitoring that readily. And if you're a name in your town, they're, they're going to uh, put it out there as a story. Mm -hmm. And then uh, third party diligence, you've kind of touched on real estate and environmental. Uh, uh, can you explain what what happens there that can affect the timeline? Yeah, I mean, this is, again, it's, it's a third party that needs to get involved in this diligence. It's somebody else that you have to hire. Um, it's also a process that can take, each of these can take several weeks or longer, um, depending, depending on how much there is to review. Um, and it, it's, it can't really be rushed. So I, I often say, you know, as a gating factor early on in looking at a transaction, is there any owned real estate involved? Because if there is, it slows it down and will be more expensive, more legal fees, just so you're aware. You know, it's kind yeah. of two and sales. And the expense is an important thing to highlight because there are expenses involved in, in uh, a phase one, phase two, or a title commitment. And those might not be expenses that you want to incur until there's some deal certainty. So even though you know it takes time, you might not be ready to do it from the moment that you sign the letter of intent. So phase one, phase two, for those who have, haven't enjoyed that process before, involves hiring environmental experts to come in, take soil samples and the like, and, uh, and do an initial assessment. That's the phase one. And then they go deeper and wider if they find things in those areas called the phase two. And so uh, frequently, you know, you'd want to know kind of early on, like at the LOI st stage, 
uh, whether that's going to be required and then make a decision about when to start that process and what will be required because it could take some time. And that obviously would impact the timeline. And then uh, buyer, buyer uh, financing, uh, what, what, what happens there? Yeah, so uh, sometimes a potential buyer um, needs to get financing in order to pay the purchase price. They don't want to take it out, out of their existing working capital to buy you, um, and so they need to get financing. Um, those bankers are going to have counsel. They're going to want to do their own due diligence and uh, ensure that you meet their standards to loan now that you're a part of the buyer group. And, you know, willingness to compromise, would, you know, what do you mean by that? I mean, we're not unreasonable people. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, for the lawyers on the line, I think there's always a joke that transactional lawyers picked this work because we don't like to fight like the litigators do. Uh, but that's not always the case. Um, there are some transactional attorneys who like to uh, win battles just as much as the litigators do. Um, and if someone wants to fight for the sake of fighting, it's necessarily going to take longer. Um, and I think one of the other things is uh, if you're dealing with a private equity buyer or a serial acquirer, um, there might be certain things that they have a party line that they just can't agree to. Or there might be certain things that they don't want to agree to because they're afraid of the precedent that it's going to set for future deals. If they agree with it for you, someone else finds out down the line, then they have to agree with it in all their future deals. Okay, terrific. So um, I, we listed out the people who are on the confidential team, and obviously, you know, this can expand or contract. Uh, and then people who are on the external team, you know, great lawyers like Morgan, who uh, get engaged to help you through the process. You might also have investment bankers, uh, accountants, insurance company uh, providers, especially uh, on, uh, I would say, both the um, reps and warranties, if that's an issue, but also really kind of walking through the health benefit insurance uh, aspects, because sometimes those can get... Um, they're obviously important to the employees. It can get a bit tricky. Um, for the confidential uh, uh, internal team, Morgan, uh, what's the impact? Uh, you alluded to this earlier about the that you're doubling their job or at least increasing it substantially, especially for smaller companies. Yeah, I mean, you want to think carefully about who's on this team, and this team might shift over time. So you might start out at the letter of intent stage, and only the CEO and CFO know about it. Then you widen it a little broader when you start negotiating, um, and then you widen it even further as, as you get closer to the time. Uh, but part of it is you need to have the people involved who are going to be able to answer questions and to, uh, to find this information. Um, and they might be, uh, the purchase agreement might lay out certain people who their knowledge is, is uh, defined within the agreement. Um, and so those people will need to read the agreement and understand it um, and inform what's disclosed. And, and fill the data room, which can take a lot of time, you know, yes. completing all material contracts, all supply contracts, all customer agreements, anything involving changes of control, et cetera, takes, no. uh, takes quite a while. So and the you other never aspect... know how good your file management system is until you have to upload a data room of all your contracts. Well, I do, I do recommend to folks, just partly because it's easier for your job, but uh, in addition, in this process, if you think there's a merger acquisition or sale of your business, just put a folder together that's called material contracts and throw a copy of the stuff in there. And maybe if you want to get fancy, break it out by topic, like uh, Morgan said, real estate, uh, technology, et cetera, uh, customer contracts, and just kind of keep that process going. So uh, I had a couple of other things just I wanted to make observations. Number one is that uh, you really are um, increasing the job of these folks, and it's important to be thinking about retention. Uh, it, it, during the deal process itself. So frequently we'll see management retention bonuses, uh, agreements uh, and the like, so that we can recognize those folks for the extraordinary work that they're doing. And then also um, uh, frequently the buyer, if they're intending to continue its, uh, the operations of the, the business, they want these folks to stay on board. And so as Morgan uh, mentioned, Often you have employment agreements 
that will be drafted at the same time as the, as the agreement itself. And so from the seller perspective, the management team is important both for the diligence process, but also because it's the team that is going to be moving forward after the transaction and is an important part of holding the value uh, together of the business. Anything else to add on this topic, Morgan? Um, yeah, on a similar note to the employment agreements, there's also probably going to be a non-compete agreement. You know, if, if you're buying a business as buyer, you don't want your seller to walk down the street and, and set up shop doing the exact same thing and, uh, and take everybody back from you that you just bought. And most uh, jurisdictions will allow a non-compete, including in California, for the sale of a business as long as the person signing that non-compete is an owner of the business and selling the goodwill. So that's an important aspect to be looking at very early on in the transaction mm -hmm. as well. Um, so we've kind of talked about some of these is why I th think we can move you know, more quickly through, through this aspect of it. Um, uh, you know, we talked, you mentioned about the letter of intent. Uh, which has the key provisions. Uh, and then uh, exclusivity period you touched on, is that a separate document? No, that's normally built into the letter of intent itself. Um, it's, I mean, it can be any time frame that normally gives a pretty good indicator of what time frame the buyer is thinking of. Um, one leverage point that sellers have is when you're looking at whether or not to agree to any automatic extension of that exclusivity period. Uh, you might be totally willing to uh, to have it extend another 30 days, but it also might be something that you want to push back on to uh, to really have a hard stop for the buyer so that they um, they have the same motivation to negotiate as you do. Got it. And then um, another kind of topic I, I wanted to touch on on this slide had to do with the due diligence process. And, you know, you've talked about um, the fact gathering aspect of it. Uh, you, you mentioned issue spotting earlier, but what do you, what kinds of issues are you looking for there? Um, it, it depends, it's a risk analysis, any financial implications and really any uh, thing that should be a condition to close. Um, something that you see a lot uh, when you're looking at contracts is non-competes that would be applicable to the buyer post-closing. Um, so it's applicable to seller and their affiliates and that then grabs you as buyer and you want to look at that carefully if it's going to uh, somehow restrict your core business and change what you are doing as buyer post closing. So I, I had an example of that recently where we were looking at the co contracts really generally and, and, and embedded in one of the customer agreements was a non solicitation for a period of time after selling to that particular customer. And so we had to look at okay it's not non compete it's non solicitation, and then who would be encompassed by that non solicitation agreement, and so those were the types of issues that were, you know, being spotted I guess in the due diligence process right. Right. No. And there are and also then, other things that you might not think about in your contracts, like a right of first refusal um, so that you have to make the offer to, to somebody else. I've seen deals blow up over this because they didn't have the right to sell to just anybody. They had to go shop it to, to this one company first. Surprise. Yeah. Not a good one. Uh, so you, you've listed out some of the other key agreements. We talked, to, of course, about employment uh, agreements uh, and the like. Uh, briefly, can you touch on the ones that you've identified here, escrow, paying agent, and commercial agreements? Yep. Um, so the escrow agreement um, is, is going to come into play um, in two instances. If you've got a purchase price adjustment um, so that the purchase price might, might shift when you look at the estimated financials to the actual financials. Um, and also to cover any indemnification um, uh, that the sellers are standing behind. So this is really so that the buyer knows there's a pocket of money from the purchase price set aside that the sellers can't touch yet, but that they can look to if something comes up after the closing. Um, and then the paying agent agreement normally comes into play um, if you have a bunch of shareholders who are going to receive payments uh, who aren't employees, so you can't run that through HR. It's really just to help with the mechanics of, of paying a number of people, making sure that taxes are withheld as appropriate and making sure that, that when that escrow is released two years down the line, that, that somebody is around 
to then pass the, that portion of the payment on to the shareholders. Got it. So it uh, could be uh, payments to employees, payments to the shareholder owners and the like, just to make sure, like you said, there's someone around to sign the check, for lack of a better phrase. Exactly. And, and sometimes it's super straightforward and the entire purchase price is getting paid to a holding company that will then do those disbursements out to the shareholders. Uh, but if, if it's going to be a number of wires at closing, most buyers aren't set up to be able to do that. For, for those two, the escrow and paying agent agreement, how, how soon before closing are they typically negotiated? Um, it's, it's again, another thing that you're dealing with a third party. So you're going to have an escrow agent, paying agent. Uh, sometimes they're the same person. Um, a lot of times your outside counsel can leverage existing relationships. So I've got some go-to escrow agents that I know can turn something around for me uh, in a week and I know their standard form and what they will agree upon, uh, but it's good to get it started early. Um, there's also information that they need. They have certain know your customer information um, that they're required to obtain uh, in order to comply with banking laws. Got it. What, did, what do you mean by comply with banking laws? What are you talking about? Uh, they have certain requirements of information that they need to ob obtain from anybody that they then are, are sending a wire to or holding money for. Got it. So you have to identify who is the, the person, that they're a real person, that uh, they are you know, not from countries where there's a restriction and that kind of thing? Right. So your executives are going to need to give a copy of their driver's license, some information about the holdings and sort of depending on how complicated your structure is. Uh, looking up the food chain to the ultimate parent company. Which all of which are some of those little details that can really slow things down when you realize, oh my gosh, I need the driver's license picture of the CFO and they're uh, on a, a trip to Asia for to meet with a customer or a supplier. Yes. And uh, so they're in, in transit right now. Oops. <laughs> and then commercial agreements, anything material uh, or that people should be paying attention for there? Um, this just kind of depends on the nature of your transaction. Sometimes there's going to be uh, sort of some side agreements that are going to carry forward uh, if they're not acquiring 100% of the business. So I've seen things like co-packing agreements um, or, or lease agreements if they're not selling the real property with the business. Got it. Now, I... Uh... You've identified some kind of key steps for the for the final stage. So, you know, by this point, you've got a letter of intent, interested buyer, you've got through due diligence, renegotiated on price, which often happens during due diligence. Uh, you renegotiate on a, on other terms. Have the asset the uh, asset or stock purchase agreement is is now been finalized, negotiated, etc. Uh, so, uh, then you have kind of three segments uh, which we looked at briefly in the timeline description, but first is simultaneous uh, versus separate sign and close. Uh, so you've asked your own questions. Typically I, I come <laughs> up with these, but thank you for helping me out. Um, uh, what is the difference between those two? And, and I guess, why would you, who wants which in with what circumstances? Yeah, so I mean, this really comes down to those third parties that you're going to have to read into the deal and when you're going to be comfortable doing that. If there are people outside of the business that, that are going to need to approve, you're probably leaning towards a separate sign and close. Not always, but probably uh, because you don't really want to go telling people about the deal until you've got some comfort that both parties are obligated to move forward outside extraordinary circumstances. Um, and, and that both parties are in material agreement on, on the terms of the deal. Got it. So in other words, to some degree, confidentiality and importance of that to the transaction is a main factor to be taking into account. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, do you want to go tell your largest customer that you're selling the business just to have to go back to them and be like, oops, sorry about that. Like something blew up and uh, and it's not going forward. Yeah. What do you mean? There's a problem with you, yeah, right? You, you yeah. don't want to even say that the deal uh, wasn't successful because they're going to think potentially it was on you, not on the other party. No. And then it's more people out there in the world that know about it who might not uh, be as cognizant about their confidentiality. There might be some loose lips and uh, it gets suddenly broadcasted to a much larger group than you were ready for. Mm 
I had a partner one time years ago who uh, was at dinner with his wife uh, in Seattle and uh, overheard this group come in of, uh, of business people and they were sitting at the table behind him. And they uh, were talking about this offer they had just made in acquiring a company. And he's kind of, you know, enjoying his dinner, but kind of listening in a little bit, realizes what they're talking about in the target uh, company and excused himself, went outside, uh, phoned a, a client he knew would be interested in buying that company. And they made an unsolicited offer and were successful. So the table behind him lost the deal because they yeah. were chatting about it over lunch. Yeah, and that is why we use these code names for deals. If you've ever wondered why you're dealing with a project Ant-Man and you have no idea what Ant-Man <laughs> is, that's exactly the reason why. Exactly. So uh, interim period, uh, you've asked a couple of questions there. What do you, can you describe that? Uh, yeah, so I mean, there during this interim period, there are certain things that you have to do, you know, those closing conditions that need to be satisfied in order to close. So go out and get those consents, um, your governmental approvals. Um, you also need to continue operating the business in the manner that you historically have. Um, and if you're going to do anything unusual, you'll need the buyer's consent. It's a fine line because the buyer can't doesn't own you yet. They can't control you for competitive reasons. Uh, but you can't go out there making extraordinary decisions or entering into long-term contracts that they're going to have to be responsible for without their consent, typically. Got it. And then uh, closing uh, is one of those things that, uh, again, back in yesteryear, uh, we used to camp out at a printer, a financial printer, and they'd bring all kinds of extraordinary food, lobster and, you know, whatnot. Uh, and I guess it doesn't probably happen quite that way anymore. You don't bring all the executives in with a special pen to sign. Right. Yeah. I mean, it can be a little bit anticlimactic these days. I mean, if I've done my job right, there's nothing to do the morning of closing. I already have all of my signatures. I already have all of the buyer signatures in hand. We've checked all the boxes. We know that everything's done. And it's either a two minute phone call or an email where the attorneys say, okay, my client's signatures are released upon your client's signatures released, done. Someone wires the funds and then you just sit around waiting for a reference number to come across. Well, knowing that you always do your job right, uh, I know you've uh, had situations helping me out where you've kind of had agreements or signatures held, what we call an escrow, where the lawyers have them, but and maybe all the lawyers have them, but they don't release the use of them till a period of time. Is that what often happens? Yeah, that that is almost always the case. It just it, it avoids that scramble and makes sure that we know uh, um, we have everything we need and we don't have to go hunting down the CEO at the 11th hour um, uh, for a missing signature. Fantastic. So we always end with a slide of pragmatic practicality, five things you can do today based on the information that you've learned uh, here in the presentation. And can you just briefly discuss them? Sure. Um, so the first one, make a timeline for tracking purposes. I know I've highlighted all the ways that timeline can blow up, but it's important uh, to have something that everyone knows they're working towards, um, but also build in time for change. I can't tell you the number of times uh, that I've had a CEO schedule uh, an exotic celebratory vacation and then the deal is pushed back a month and when you really need them to answer questions, they're in Bermuda. Um, so don't do that. Wait until the money hits your bank account before you schedule that. Um, the yeah. second one is that stay on top of those critical milestones that are outside your team's control. You know, your team can do a big push and make things happen on a short time frame, but you have limited control over those third parties, so you don't want to let them slip through the cracks. The third is determine ahead of time who you're going to need to involve in the deal and when, and don't forget to instruct them on their do's and don'ts, confidentiality requirements, who else they can talk to about this deal and the like. Um, last, uh, fourth, communicate your deal breakers and priorities and your negotiation preferences to your advisors. If there are certain things that you care about, they need to know that. If there are certain things that you do not care about, 
that's great. You don't want to delay the timeline because your attorney's fighting for some sentence that you could not care less about. Um, and lastly, don't lose sight of the goal and the next step integration. It's easy to get really caught up on signing this document and not think about what that means. I actually had one deal uh, where I asked the client, okay, are you, are you ready to sign and close tomorrow? And they're like, yeah, we think so. But like, what happens then? I'm like, well, you own the business and you run the business. And they're like, oh no, wait, like we do not have anybody ready to do that. We need more time. I'm like, okay, then we're, we're not ready. <laughs> You know, I, I call it that fifth one. I'm so glad you mentioned it. Um, uh, and it's obviously an incredible segue into the third part of this three-part series. But but also, uh, you know, I call it the D-Day plus one problem. There's so much a focus on, you know, capture the beaches and you have all kinds of groups of people who are there uh, ready to, to get this deal done. And in particular, in the context of mergers and acquisitions, there are a lot of people who are very strongly, have a strong interest in making sure the deal closes and getting it done, um, but who will pretty much go away uh, after yeah. the, the deal is concluded and then you're left with what you bought. And as I say with D-Day, you know, the, once you capture the beaches three days later, those guys need toilet paper. And they need food and, and they need, you know, gasoline and all the other things that need to happen. And so making sure that supply line of production and operations is there uh, and integration, uh, it's always a heavier lift than people expect. And that's precisely why it, uh, we're going to devote an entire interactive dialogue to that topic. Uh, so any final comments, Morgan? Uh, no, I think that covers it. Thanks for the opportunity to chat today. Absolutely. So a couple of housekeeping things as we close out. First, for those who would like CLE credit, you uh, should complete the sign-in sheet that was included in yesterday's reminder email. We had one person who uh, had uh, accidentally deleted that reminder email. So if you need it, uh, just uh, shoot an email to Michelle Hubble and she can get information to you. We'll send out CLE certificates then. For those that are in the cooperative space, uh, Morgan and I have been part of a team at Dorsey to put together a book on cooperative business law. It's known as 30 edition and available on Amazon or the like or through your Dorsey uh, team as well. And um, uh, then uh, last but not least, if you have questions that you thought about or you thought, okay, well, I'd like to ask this question, but I'm not sure if this is the form to do so, then please uh, contact either myself or Morgan probably Morgan, because <laughs> uh, she's the person I would ask uh, for, for these topics for sure. Uh, we're, we're delighted to help you and so delighted to be part of the industry and part of helping so many great clients do so much great work uh, for the world as, as Morgan uh, described. So with that, please uh, thank you and please join us for our next interactive dialogue as part of this three-part series. You'll be receiving uh, information about that as we schedule it with more information and thank you. And thank you, Morgan, uh, not only for a great presentation, but for the privilege of working together on so many deals. Thanks, Mike.